don't know what that uh, song is supposed to say about me, but it is what it is. Everybody doing all right? Great to be here with you today. Thanks for coming. So nice to uh, enjoy this beautiful sunny day. I know it's not sunny, but it's the power of positive thinking. So, hey, uh, I used to love playing golf. I used to love it. When I, was a, when I was in probably ninth grade, I got introduced to the sport, and I loved it. We, I remember I got my first set of golf clubs. I'm pretty confident they were like Dunlap golf clubs, you know, from Walmart. And uh, I, I think they were, because I remember I broke a couple of heads right off the golf clubs, you know, swinging them. But I got them for Christmas in Indiana and went out and played golf that day. It was cold. You know, but when you love something, you do foolish things. I played all through the winter, you know. It, we didn't get snow like we would here there in Indiana, but it would be cold because there's nothing to stop the wind. It's just like this flat, like, you know. But we would go out, my friends, I would go out and play. Uh, we would play all summer long. I remember uh, you could get a junior pass in the city of Indianapolis, and I think we had to pay like $99 for the pass, if that. And you could play any golf course, nine holes for $1.50, or 18 holes for $3, and there was like 12 public golf courses that you could do as a, it was a junior pass. And I think uh, you had to like tee off between like certain hours, you know, so you could be, but we would play golf all the time. I mean, I was at a golf course, I was at the putting green, I was on the driving range, I was doing something every day for years. I loved to play golf, took golf lessons, loved it, was never good enough to make the golf team, but I loved it. I loved to play golf. It was so much fun. And then kind of life happened. I, I went to college, and when I went to college, I didn't even have the three bucks to go play then if it was that little. You know, I just didn't have the money. It was too expensive, right? And, and then I got married. And I had kids, you know, and go through the season. It's like, who's got six hours to go play golf, you know? And then I, I, a few years ago, it was probably like five or six years ago, um, I tried to, like, get back into it, you know? And I wanted to, I started to play. And I, I had lost it, you know, whatever it is, whatever I had, I, I lost it. And I would go out, and I'd have a good time, but I knew I could be so much better, and so I just didn't want to, I, I didn't have the time, though, to be on the putting green and at the driving range. And so I just kind of said, forget it, I'm done. And I kind of gave up. So now I have golf clubs in the basement, you know, and they get brought out like once every year or once every other year when there's like a charity golf tournament and somebody tells me about it, so I go play. But like, it's just, it's not my thing anymore. I don't have passion about it. Do I love the game of golf? Yeah, I think it's a great game. I think it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I like the time out there, but I'm just not passionate about it, right? I used to be passionate about, about it, but it's gone. Like life has happened. Now, let me ask you this question. What is your used to? Like, what's your used to? Like, what in your life you say, oh, I used to love, or I used to be really passionate about this. Maybe it was football. Maybe you're like Uncle Rico, right? Do you ever see Napoleon Dynamite? You know, it's the high school days, college, high school football, you know? What was the I used to? And you can think about it. It's not that you don't love it anymore, or not that you don't think it's valuable, but you've lost kind of the passion for it, the drive for it. Like, we all have those things in our lives that at some point in time, either the passion wanes or there was just a, there never really was a passion. Maybe you have something that you enjoy or you find the value of it, but you're just not super passionate about it, but you just kind of do it because you're supposed to, right? Like, how many of you have something? Like you have a used to thing, like, you know, something that you were really passionate about, raise your hand, and then not anymore. Hopefully, it's not your marriage, but, you know, something in your life, you know, that you used to be really passionate about, right? Here's the issue. Most of us in the room would say that God is very valuable. Most of us in the room would say that our spirituality is very important to us, that we, we love it, that we love God. Many of us would say that. Many of us would say, you know, the church is really important, and I love the church, and I, I am, I'm a part of Curtis Lake. That's my church. I belong to it, but we're not passionate about those things. Like, we're not doubting their importance but there's just not a passion about it. That we just kind of have kind of this go through the motion experience. And sometimes our go through the motion experience doesn't really line up with what we actually say. It's like I can say, oh man, I love golf. I love to play golf. Really, Ryan? Well, how often do you play golf? About once every two years. <laughs> like, what do you mean you love to play golf? No, I do. Every time I'm out, I have a good time. <laughs> I just don't go very often. And that's kind of what happens with faith and spirituality in church, right? We say, man, I love church, but 
I go twice a month, if that. Maybe once every month, and I feel great. You know, I love it. It's so important. Right? And there's no passion there. It's just kind of like this thing that maybe I'm a once, a once every three weeks. The truth is, there is, the statistics say that most people consider themselves a regular part of a church if they go once every three to five weeks. How could we actually possibly say we love something that's so important where we're supposed to be connected, we're supposed to know one another, and, and say with such high value that I belong to this church, and yet it's kind of a, a tagline. It said, well, if, if all the stars line up correctly, if the right teams aren't playing on Sunday, if my shows weren't on too late on Saturday, if the sports line up right on Sunday, I'll go maybe on Monday. There's a, there's a disconnect there, though, when we talk about passion for it. And, and let's talk about the Bible for a second, right? Many of us in the room would say, oh, the Bible, that's really important. I have one of those. I have, I'm, I have more than one of those. I've got a lot of those. Those are great. Bibles are great. I steal them every time I go to the hotel. They're awesome. I want to have them. I love those Gideons. They're great. Right? We value the Bible. We even say, I believe the Bible is God's word. And, and many of us in the room, we would say, I'm following Jesus, and what the Bible tells me is truth. But I, I don't really read it. I live by it, but I don't read it. Or if I do read it, it's because somebody told me I was supposed to read it in one year. And so I go on the six-year Bible reading plan because, you know, the Bible says for six years you shall read me and on the seventh year you rest from it, right? We just, we try and get it all in in six years. We feel really good about it, right? There's, a, there, there's not passion there. It's there. It's a Bible. Okay, great. But, but we're not really passionate about what it has to say. We say we want to live our lives by it. We might even say it's God's word. It's his authority. It's truth. But we haven't really taken the time to begin to love it, to listen to it. Oh, let's talk about prayer. Who wants to talk about prayer? Let's talk about prayer for a second while I'm on a roll here. All right? Here's another, let's talk about passion in prayer and a prayer life. Many of us love prayer. Many of us love the idea of prayer. And you know when we love the idea of prayer and we are like prayer warriors? When we are in trouble. <laughs> right? We pray when there is trouble. Like when life goes downhill, when there's a problem, when the marriage is falling apart, when the month is coming to an end and rent is due in three days and you've only got 30%, man, you're on your knees, you're fasting, you're giving up everything, you're making deals with God, you're bartering, you're, you can have everything, God, you know, everything, you can have all of me, I'll go to Africa, just help me pay the rent, you know. Like we're good at that kind of prayer, but when was the last time we encountered God in prayer? When was the last time that we actually just sat without an agenda, without a list of prayer requests, without a deep sense of trouble, and we were just in God's presence, and we were changed by it? When was the last time we were driven by that kind of passion? What about this question? Are you closer to God? Are you closer to Jesus? now than you were one year ago. Like if, you, if your relationship with God were a line graph, you know, and on one side were the years and on one side was like a scale of relational connectedness, let's say, like where you were connected to God and God was connected to you and, and your decisions in life were being changed and shaped by your understanding of faith and Jesus and by the word of God, would you be able to say, well, yeah, I've moved, you know, I've moved up and to the right. Or would it be, well, I'm kind of asking the same questions. I'm all for questions, don't get me wrong. I'm all for being at a place where exploring, like some of us in the room where you're exploring faith right now, and you're trying to figure things out, and I think that's awesome. You're asking tough questions about God. You're asking tough questions about Jesus and the idea of exclusivity of Jesus, and can Jesus really be the only way? What does that mean? And you're asking questions about suffering and pain and, and religions in the world that have caused so much conflict. And those are great questions. And I think it's brilliant that you're asking those questions. And I think those questions are not in any way too much for God to answer. But what I'm nervous about is there are some of us in the room who started asking those same questions a year ago, and we are still asking them because we haven't done the hard work of answering them. And we hide behind those questions but we've never actually taken the time to get passionate about finding the answer and exploring what does it mean. The tagline for this series is, my faith a joke? 
Now, that is a challenging question. Like, that's a question right there that, like, will make you not want to come back to church next week. Like, oh, how dare he? Well, the good news is I don't work on commission, so don't come back next week. Right? They're going to give me the same paycheck whether you stay or leave, right? But listen, here's the deal. Like, I'm here to challenge you, and this series is here to challenge us for the next five weeks. We are going to get uncomfortable because here's the question. Is your faith, is my faith a joke? Is it laughable compared to our hobbies? I love that picture, by the way. <laughs> right? I mean, is it laugh? If somebody on the outside, if an alien were to come down and like hear what we have to say about how important the Bible is and how important the body of Christ is and how much we love God and then look at the decisions that we make and, and how we spend our time and, and look at how often we read our Bible and, and how often we actually spend time in prayer with God and how connected we are to his church and how connected God's word is to the actual day-to-day -day decisions of our lives, would they roll over laughing at us? When you compare the dedication, the commitment that so many religions of our world require of their adherence, have we allowed the concept of grace, have we used that as an excuse to cheapen our relationship with God? And here's what's happened. Like, the reality is, our faith, if we're really honest with ourselves, with myself, it's missing something. It's missing passion. It's missing drive. It's missing this idea that it is everything to me, that it opens me, it wakes me up in the morning and it opens my eyes to the beauty of the world and it challenges me and it sends me into dark corners and it sends me into relationships that are difficult and hard. It causes great pain in my life because the passion that I have for God and his word forces me to make sacrifices that I don't wanna make. Like there's passion that's missing. Now some of us in the room, here, here's the truth, our relationship with God has lost its passion. Right? There's some of us in here who you've been following Jesus for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you can point back to a time in your life, and I can point back to a time in my life where I was so much more passionate about God, where I was just soaking him up, and that passion is gone. It's lost. It's been replaced with the status quo. It's been replaced with, well, God challenged me to give, and, and I started giving, and I'm, I'm giving, and now that's just a part of my life. Or God challenged me to lead a small group, and so I stepped down in faith, and I led that small group, and now I've been leading a small group for 10 years. There's nothing challenging about that. There's nothing that really requires passion and zeal for. It just kind of requires my willingness to check a box and say, I did it. And we've lost passion in this thing called faith, and here's why. This is, you, you want to know why I think we've lost passion? Good, two of you. You guys don't have to give in the offering today. Everybody else, double it up or pay attention, okay? Listen, and again, I don't work on commission, so I don't care how much you give in the offering, all right? Listen, here's why we're losing passion in the church. And I'm not talking about just Curtis Lake. I'm talking about Christendom, okay? In my experience and in my the opportunities that God has for me to travel and to be a part of what he's doing primarily here in New England, let me share with you what my just, this is my take, my two cents on what's happening. Why passion is being drained out of our spirituality and out of the Christian movement. It's because we are a society and a culture of consumers. And consumerism is sucking the passion out of our relationship with God and with his church. Why? Because consumerism changes our part in the body of Christ to this is where I go, not what I am. Like I go to church and the church becomes another thing that I consume, like Walmart or Kmart. Who's been to Kmart before? Anybody been to Kmart? Some of you just a tear rolled down your eye. Like, oh, Kmart. What happened to the blue light special? And it's very subtle, right? The consumerism is very subtle. And here's what I mean by that. When, when I'm up here talking, or when Brett is up here, or when uh, Karen is up here hosting, and, and one of us says something like this, we had a great trunk or treat last night. In your mind, do you picture yourself as part of that we, or do you disassociate yourself with the we and think, oh, the church had a great trunk or treat event. When one of us comes up and says, hey, listen, we need to collect 200,000 pieces of candy, in your mind, do you go, well, 
they need 200,000 pieces of candy, so I'm going to go to the store, I'm going to buy candy, and I'm going to give the candy to them. Or is it, oh, we need 200,000 pieces of candy to make our trunk or treat a success, to reach our community, and so we need to go out and bring candy in together. And we have among us a few people who have decided to volunteer and lead the effort, but we are working together because we are the body of Christ. And you don't think that way. You know why I know that? Because I have to beg you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) We don't think that way because we live in a consumer world that when you hear the word we, you go into Walmart mode or you go into like BJ over the announcement mode. Here's what happened to me at BJ's this past week. I was there buying candy again. Okay, I am so happy that the candy thing is over with. I can eat now, all right? (laughs) I'll be honest with you. In the past years, we we bought candy, and we didn't really have to sacrifice anything. We tried to buy it, but this year, we had to make some sacrifices to buy candy because that was a lot of candy, you know what I'm saying? So we're at BJ's, like, last run to get candy, all right? And so we're in the store. We got the cart. My daughter, Micah, is with me, and here we are. Uh, Wendy and Judah are out in the car, Go in, get the candy, it's in the cart, and then all of a sudden it's like, uh, hello, BJ's, uh, members. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm a member at BJ's. Like, I've got the card and everything. Like, I am a member, right? And here's what they say. <laughs> I'm going to do this again, so watch your ears. <laughs> I saw some of you jump. So, we have a great bargain. We're going to give away something free to all of our members over at aisle seven. Okay. Now listen, when he said, we've got something free, did I go, oh, I've got something free for me? No, what did I do? I said, oh, BJ's, like this corporation, this company, they've got something free. And I'm always up for something free. Lord knows I've given him enough money for candy, so I'm going to get my free gift. <laughs> That's what I think. And then it, it gets better. Uh, we have a stainless steel free gift for all the adults, all the adult members, to which I immediately was like, am I in an adult BJ? What, what is going on here? Like, I was like looking around, like, where am I? Just want to make sure I'm in the right store, okay? So I go over there, and I said, Micah, should we go over and get, the, yeah, let's go get the free thing. So I'm assuming this is going to be cool because I can't give it to kids. <laughs> so I'm like, it's going to be sharp? <laughs> it's going to be great. Or you're going to be sharp, or you're going to have to be 21 to drink it. Either way, I'm in, right? This is what I'm thinking, okay? I'm just being honest, all right? So... And I'm just kidding. So listen, so we go over there. Some of you are just shaking your heads at me right now. Oh my gosh, why do I go to church here? Listen, okay, so I go over there, right? And sure enough, this kid comes out, poor kid. He just was so nervous. He was shaking, he was like shaking. He had to do this presentation because they were going to give you the free gift, but you got to sit through this seven-minute presentation for like the, uh, it's like, a, um, like some sort of a guillotine like thing that chops foods. What is that called? A mandolin, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a mandolin, right? So, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. so he's going through the demonstration. He's like, here's, we're going to give you this paring knife. It's a 99 cent value. <laughs> you know? I'm thinking, I'm going to get the mandolin. No, so, so I, now I, I don't want to be like a jerk and walk away from the poor kid. So I'm like, oh, I got to sit through this presentation. I remember my wife and son around the car waiting. I was sent in to buy like candy. It's been like 20 minutes already because I'm like a kid. I'm like, what else do we need, Micah? This thing's got everything, right? So, so I'm watching the demonstration. He goes through the whole thing, and he, he gives the knives away, and, and, and in that moment, like, I'm, I'm a total consumer. Like, I'm not thinking, even though I'm a member of BJ's, I'm not thinking, look what I've provided for myself. I've provided a free knife through my membership. No, I'm thinking to myself, they have for me a free gift. So I go over there. And I also ended up with a mandolin, which is cool. I made french fries last night. So it worked. (laughs) I'm going to fry them up today in my fryer, which I bought at another point in time. (laughs) I love gadgets. So listen, but it's consumer-mindedness. That's what we think about when we go to church. It's the same mentality. Even if we're members... It's the same mentality. And if we aren't careful, the little subtle ways that we speak and talk and act and sign up for things, we become consumers. I hope there's a small group for me. I hope that there's a class I like. I hope that I like the message. I hope that I like the music. I hope that they are funny. I hope that Ryan wears a t-shirt that makes me laugh today. I ha- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, I hope they... And, and there's an us and them, and we, and, and we have to be so careful because it's so subtle, but it's created this chasm between the stage where I stand on 
and the seat where you sit in. And that has drained the passion because we've become even consumers of Christianity as opposed to seeing ourselves as part of a movement that are connected to one another, bound to one another through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this together, that yes, we come and get encouraged through the preaching of God's word. We get encouraged by people who lead us in singing and we get energized, but there's so much more to me just coming and sitting in the pew. It's being a participant in the kingdom of God and seeing ourselves together as one. So consumerism has led us to this place where it's like, I hope they set up, like, where's the class I can take? And, and when we say, hey, pray and read your Bible, it's like, well, what should I read? What should I pray? You need to provide that for me. And so what happens is, through our consumerism, it leads to a measure of complexity in our faith. Because what happens? Well, as the church, we're like, well, we want to serve. As your pastor, I say, I want to serve you. I want to make sure you're growing spiritually. So what do I do? I just start creating all these things that can help you grow spiritually. Well, if you do this, if you sign up for this, if you get in this class, if you sign up for this, if you volunteer, if you give to this, right? And we, this complexity, and if you're a checkbox person, which I'm a checkbox person, we all are, we all love to be sure that we know what we're doing is going to get us into heaven, right? That's our mentality. So we go, okay, the pastor says to do this, or they say to do this, or they say to give to this, or they say to put a trunk together, so I'm gonna put a trunk together. And we check the box and check the box and check the box and check the box because that feels good. And this makes me think I'm moving in the right direction. And complexity in religion turns religion into this desire to please. I wanna please the pastor, I wanna please God, I wanna please somebody, so just please tell me what to do. Rather than religion as an expression of love that all of my actions, all of my behaviors, all the things that I do and don't do and sign up for and don't sign up for and give to and don't give to, that all of it is an expression of love. And so we have complicated it and we've made it very complex and we have brought consumerism into our mindset of faith. And why we do this is because, listen, in an effort to make it simple, it can all of a sudden become about me and about consumerism. So in an effort to make it simple, as a leadership team in our church and as your pastor, we sit down and pray through and say, okay, here's a great path for people to begin to grow in faith. Starting point, great expectations, multiply, get into a home team, share your life with them. This is a good pathway. It's a good pathway to get started. And so we start people just like you would a toddler. Like you have a little baby and they start to walk, what do you do? Do you like, <laughs> no, what do you do? Like they get a hold of their fingers and you walk with them, right? Am I the only one who did this? Are you all that bad of parents? Like, listen, I'm not the cover of Parenting Magazine, but come on, people, right? So we walk with them, and then eventually we kind of like rip the finger away from them, and they've got that big old melon, and so like they don't know how to balance everything, right? You ever notice how big a kid's head is? It is huge, all right? So... <laughs> Put a baby's arms like this. See how much space there is? You put your baby's hands like this, it's, they're like this. It's huge, right? So there, it's just the truth. So they're walking, and, and, and so in a, creating a pathway to start to walk for ourselves, here's what we've done in the church. We have walked with you. Now you're like a full-on adult. And I'm like, come on, come on. Like, how foolish would that be? How foolish would that be? My son who's 12 years old, who can walk perfectly fine. If I'm like, okay, grab my fingers, grab my fingers. Or even better yet, your kids, how many of your kids are taller than you? Raise your hand right now. Okay, grab my, grab my fingers, grab my fingers. <laughs> At some point, you gotta let go, right? That's what it means to mature. And it's the same with faith. At some point, we have to mature and begin to, like as a, as a corporate church, like those organizational things that we have to have, they have to stop and it has to start being this personal, passionate love for God. And so there's got to be a movement. So for those of you that are here and you're exploring faith, like this church is the place for that because there's, there's this kind of graduated way to do that. And we love it. And we're going to talk about starting points. So I'm not down on those things. But some of us are in the same cycle. We're like, well, can I do starting point again? No, you cannot do starting point for the 15th time. <laughs> Get out of the nest, you know? Like there's this point where or when we are so focused on somebody providing for me a program to grow spiritually, passion sucks. It just sucks the life out of you. It's like, it's like in a relationship, right? There are moments where you and your spouse, like you might read a book together. There are moments where you and your spouse might go to counseling together. But there's a lot of time where you just kind of 
wrestle it out on your own. And by wrestle, I don't mean sex. I mean other things, you know. Like you just have to deal with it and you've got to get in there and you've got to grapple together and you've got to figure out how to make it work, right? That's, that's what it means to be mature and to grow and to have passion and to have something that you think is so valuable, you fight for it and you don't need a map all the time. But I'm going to give you one for today, okay? So here's what we're going to do. That's just the intro, by the way. Okay, good. <laughs> that's the longest part, all right? So here's what I want to do very quickly. Jesus poo-pooed the complexity and the consumerism of religion. He, 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 he drilled down and he said, this is very simple. This is why the problem, because, because even religion then and Judaism then had become very complex and become very consumeristic and Jesus just nails it on the head how you fight it and how you regain passion. And then I'm gonna talk about why Jesus and the jester and then we're gonna talk about this movement, right, from shallow to passionate. Like, how many of you just want to have a shallow marriage? Raise your hand up nice and high. Shallow marriage, shallow relationship with your children when they're adults. Like, just as long as they show up for Christmas, you'll be happy. Anybody shallow? How many of you want to have a passionate relationship with your spouse? Right? How many of you want to have a passionate relationship with your children as adults? Right? Different kind of passion, but nonetheless, passion, right? It's the same with God. Like, we don't wake up and be like, man, I just, I hope that in 20 years I just have this real shallow faith. You know, where I don't really know God and God doesn't know me, but I just kind of feel good about going to church every three weeks. I just kind of feel good because I know the books of the Bible. I had to learn them when I was in Sunday school, so that, that stuck with me. Like, we don't want that. We want passionate spirituality, right? So, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 36. Jesus is getting into an argument with some religious leaders. Not, he's not really arguing. He's just kind of putting them in their place, but they're trying to trick him. And he has this kind of conversation with a group of leaders known as the Sadducees, and, and the Pharisees freak out, right? Because the Sadducees got put in their place really, really quickly. Now, what you need to know, if you're new to Bible studies, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two different groups within Judaism, kind of like, you know, Baptists and Methodists, right? Just different groups, kind of like non-denominational and denominational, right? So in our, in our town, we have the Baptist church and we have other Christian churches and you've got Curtis Lake and there's Evergreen that's, a, uh, a, that's an evangelical covenant church and we're all part of the Christian faith, but we're just kind of these different brands. Well, that's what was happening here with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They just had way cooler names than we did, right? Okay, so here's the deal. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That was a huge dividing point. Pharisees did. And so Jesus just like put them in their place about what they believed with uh, the resurrection. And the Pharisees kind of freak out. So this is what the Bible says, right? It says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. Now, here's what happens, right? The Pharisees have spent most of their existence trying to silence the Sadducees. <laughs> And Jesus does it like, like that. So they're freaking out a little bit. They're like, oh man, if he put them in his place, he's gonna, we, gotta, we gotta come up with a way better question than their question, or else he's gonna get us too. So they got together, they figure out their question. The Bible says one of them, an expert in the religious law, okay, that's how complicated it was. <laughs> you had to have experts in religious law. That's how complicated the system had become. This expert tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, this may seem like a no big deal question to you, but this is a huge question because if Jesus doesn't answer this correctly, he's basically saying, oh, there's a whole bunch of things you don't need to worry about in there. And the law was how you made yourself right with God. The law was how you were, knew you were right with God, how you stayed ritually pure. And so this was a big question. And this question reveals the reality that Judaism and following God had become a religion of unbearable complexity. This was not the Ten Commandments. This was 513 legal codes as to what you could and couldn't do on different days of the week if you were male or female, what you could wear, what you couldn't wear, what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, when you cooked certain things, how you had to cook it and where you had to cook it and what you were allowed to cook it in. Like, this was highly, highly complex. It was a series of checkbox. I did this, I did this, I did this, I didn't do this. In fact, it was so complex, Jesus is recorded in the next chapter of Matthew as saying this about the religious leaders. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. It was like they found their success in making religion as complex and as difficult as possible, and it was draining the passion out of people. And Jesus came with a totally different message. And so this is how Jesus replies to the question. Many of you know it. 
He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. What Jesus was saying here in our language would be, you know what? Loving God is the hardware. That's the hardware that everything exists and functions within. Like, that's it. That's the hardware. It, it, it's, what, it's what brings everything together. Everything works in our lives. Everything works in our world when the starting point is loving God with everything you have. And what he's referencing here is this verse that's found in Deuteronomy that's known within Judaism as the Shema. Because the first Hebrew word is, is Shema, which means listen. Listen, Shema, O Israel, is what it says. Hear, O Israel. And then it goes into this beautiful phrase. It says, the Lord is our God. Jews to this day quote this, Hashem Eloheinu. God, they don't even say the word Yahweh. They say Hashem, which means the name is our God. And they quote it in Hebrew. They say Hashem Eloheinu. The Lord is our God. Hashem Achad. The Lord is one. This was the statement that we serve a monotheistic God. There is only one true God, and it is our God. And this was what was grounding of the people in Judaism. And they love this, and they still to this day quote this over and over again. This is one of the most important prayers. It says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. This was the cornerstone, and Jesus knew it. This was the hardware. you got to love God with everything. Now, these three phrases, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, these are really difficult, nuanced by Hebrew words. That's a joke. That's nothing, okay? I'm being silly. This is not complicated. We love to make it complicated. Well, what does it mean, all your heart? What does it mean, all your soul? I think if we're honest, it's pretty self-explanatory. Every part of you... Like, you don't need to know what Hebrew word, what the Hebrew word for heart meant, what the Hebrew word for mind meant. What's the difference between the heart and the mind? Doesn't really matter because it covers it all. Every part of you, every little bit of you, every decision, everything, every part of your soul, everything is to be madly and deeply in love with God. Jesus says, this is the hard word. This is where it all starts. And then he goes on and he says, but the second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Equally important. Did you know that the way you love your neighbor, Jesus is saying, is just as important as the way you love God? That you can think you're so perfect because you have fulfilled all these commandments, but if you aren't loving your neighbor as yourself, eh, just as important as a love for God is a love for your neighbor. What he's saying is the operating system, the thing that makes all the hardware work and talk and function properly is this, is the love of your neighbor. That's how you operate. That's how you function that's what makes it work. And then he goes on and he closes it out brilliantly because he leaves nothing for them to say. He says, but you know what? The entire law and all the demands of the prophets, everything is based on these two commandments. Everything you do is based upon the hardware and the operating system. In other words, every app that you install in your life depends on the right hardware and the right operating system if you're going to follow God. Is love for God, number one, is as equally important how you love your neighbor, and then everything else you do flows out of that. It flows out of that. He's brilliant. Now, here's what I want you to get. What Jesus says is so simple. He didn't, you, you, don't, you don't even need to write it down. Love God, love my neighbor. <laughs> everything else comes from that. I mean, that's how simple it was, but it wasn't shallow, and it wasn't easy. See, we mistake simple with shallow, and so we make things so complex, right? Simple and shallow are two very different concepts. And we can have a complex faith that is very, very shallow. Check the box, check the box, check the box. No passion involved. No real understanding. No life change. No transformation. Or we can have a very simple faith that says, I will love God with every ounce and every fiber of my being, and I will love my neighbor as myself. And that is extremely, extremely difficult to do. And that in and of itself has a measure of complexity behind it. Like, what does that mean when my neighbor believes and functions and acts differently and, and does things that I think are so contrary to human flourishing? What does it mean to love them? Like, this is hard stuff, but it's so simple. Love God. Love your neighbor. So here's the question. 
This is what we're getting at, right? If this is the faith that Jesus is saying, this is what it means to follow God. Here's my question, like, does our faith look like that? Does our faith look like we're following Jesus who says, love God, love others, or does our faith look like we're following a jester? Right, is that what it is? So we have some, we have some jesters for you today, right? So you can look at our jesters as they come out here. What's the typical behavior of a jester, right? Our jesters are entertainers, you know? Like, they have incredible skills. Look at how skillful these people are. They can throw balls in the air, and they can juggle colorful scarves and hit sticks. And I'm not sure what Dave's doing over there, but he's doing it, you know, with the rings. And we've got these, you know, socks with rocks at the end of it, you know, and, and we've got the unicycle going, right? I mean, there's entertainment here. These are all pretty one-dimensional things, though, right? I mean, if you'd watch carefully, each of them is just doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> they're not doing anything different. It's the same thing over and over again. But they're all facing this way. So I know, and they're here to be entertained. That's why they're coming to church, right? We want to be entertained. And there she goes, right? I mean, it's wonderful. Right? It's kind of a distraction from the reality of what I'm doing here. It's like, oh, look. You know? So when they come out, right, it's humorous, it's fun. Now, after a few minutes, though, what happens? The best thing that happens is that. Right? The most interesting thing is when somebody messes up. Right? That's, that's jester, right? Like when the jester falls, trips, makes a mistake, when you, you drop the ball that you're juggling, like that's what you're waiting for now. Good job, Chris, right? Thank you for illustrating the point. And that's kind of jester faith. And you and I have faith like that. We are so busy. We have all kinds of things that we're juggling and we're doing and we're doing and we're doing. But the only thing interesting about it is when something goes really wrong, right? That's the reality of it. That's jester faith. It distracts us from the realities of our life, but it doesn't affect us. It doesn't change us. And why is it that within the Christian community, what we love so much is a good failure story? What we love so much is a good church that implodes, a good pastor that has a moral failure. Let's talk about that, right? Because we have no transformation. There's no deep hurt in us when we see that happen. We just love to talk about it. So that's jester faith. Give our jesters a great big hand. Right? Lots of activity. Church and God can be a wonderful distraction, be a great distraction from life. But it's not transformational. See, the jester is the perfect foil to who Jesus is, the opposite, the very opposite. The jester who's one-dimensional and whose humor is cheap and only lasts for a moment. You know, Jesus was multidimensional to the point where he was God and man in flesh. God incarnate. That he was simple but profound. Not simple and foolish, not, but simple and profound. That Jesus was, was the answer to our reality, not an escape from our reality. That at the end of the day, Jesus wasn't about making us laugh. He wasn't deeply concerned about whether we were happy or not. He was here to point us to how you could have deep joy. And the question is, if you look at your faith and if I look at my faith, is my faith more representative of a whole bunch of activity but no passion? Am I just kind of entertaining God? Look at what I'm doing for you, God. Look at it. Look at what I'm doing. But I have no depth to it. There's no meaning. There's no transformation. I'm, a, I'm once every three weeks at church. I read my Bible when I, you know, when I really feel guilty enough. And I'm not driven to do these things out of a passion for Christ and the gospel and a love for his church. That's what we're wrestling with. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to let God's word mess with us deeply. And so I would encourage you, if you don't want to be challenged, if you don't want to be offended, if you don't want to have to kind of defend a little bit of your faith existence, then you might not want to come the next four weeks. Take some time off, right? Watch television, watch, watch some church online, watch some church on TV, and then come back in four or five weeks if you just want to stay in the status quo of your faith. Because God's Word is going to challenge us. Our communicators are going to challenge us with what it means to move from shallow faith into passionate spirituality. And so next week, we're going to ask this question. You know what? Am I simply attending on Sunday, or am I being attentive every day? See, a jester just shows up when they're called, shows up to the court, does their thing, right? But Jesus' faith is attentive, not just shows up once every three weeks, not just even shows up every week. Like, well, you might come to church every week, but that's the only time you're attentive to the work of God. So that's jester faith. Jesus' faith is I'm attentive every moment of every day because he's at my core, at the very center of my existence. 
And then week number three, we're going to ask this question. Do I occupy a pew in a church or am I passionate for the church? Huge difference. Do I occupy that seat in the pew? Do I check the box and go to church or do I truly live out the reality that I am the church, that I am the body of Christ, that I'm called to love one another? that I'm called to care for people who are part of my church family, that I'm called to give of my life, that I exist in a small group not for myself but for the sake of others. I attend church not for myself. I don't just go for myself. That's a huge part of it, but I go to be connected with the body of Christ because I am called to bear one another's burdens. I'm called to live in this sense of community, and at a larger church like ours, you have to take extra effort to do that because you don't know everybody. You can't know everybody. Guess what? You're not gonna know everybody in heaven anyway. So get used to it. Like, that's what I have to say. But I don't own a big church. Okay, fine, go to a smaller church. I don't care, that's fine. But just remember, at some point in time, like, you're still not gonna know everybody. I hate to break the news to you, but when you die and go to heaven, if you know Jesus and spend eternity with God, it's not like you become all knowing all of a sudden. That was never promised. Like, you're not gonna know everything. You're gonna have to learn things. You're gonna exist and live. You're gonna meet new people. It is the kingdom of God, right? It's just, and, and I hope there's so many people there that it takes all of eternity to meet everybody once. Like, that's my plan. That's what I'm working towards. What are you working towards? You know, and I think this reality is like we have to understand that we're called to be in such deep connection that we can't just occupy a pew. We need to be passionate for the church, for the growth of it and the strength of it. And that's got to motivate our decisions. Then in week four, we're going to ask this question, do I know God or do I know about God? See, like the jester knows about the king, but he doesn't know the king. See, that's jester faith. Jester faith is what I know about God. I go and I listen to the, 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 the woman or the man up there t- preaching, and they talk about God. It's great. I feel good about it, and I go back to my life. And every now and then in the middle of the week, I'll remember something that was said, and I'll try to apply it. So I kind of know about God, but do you know God deeply and intimately? Because that's what his deepest desire is, to know you. Believe it or not, his deepest desire isn't a bunch of check boxes for you to fill out. He wants you to know him. He wants to know you. And then finally, we're going to wrap up this series with, I think, probably one of the most difficult questions in our culture and in our lives as Christians is, am I a fan of good advice or am I a follower of God's word? This is a tough one. I hope I'm out of town on this one and somebody else is speaking. I don't remember. I think maybe this one's yours, Josh, so good luck with it. Um, Because this is a tough one because I'm gonna tell you there are things that the Bible says are sin that I do that I wish the Bible didn't say it was sin and I wish I could just say, well, you know, it's just who I am. And, but if I'm truly gonna have a Jesus faith, then I can't just be a fan of good advice. I can't just see the Bible as this thing that I can go to or, or the preacher is somebody who gives me, you know, she just gives me some good advice to live. Like I have to recognize the weight and the authority that God has and the guardrails that he's set up and I have to learn to not put my identity in my behaviors, put my identity in Christ so that I can call behavior sin. It's, it's, it, it's quite challenging thought, especially in our culture that would say, well, you know, who you are, embrace it and go for it, no matter what that is. But the Bible says, no, there's guardrails around life and what you do with your time and the relationships that you have and who you live with and who you share a bed with and when you should share a bed with that person. The question is, are we simply fans or are we followers? Is it jester faith or is it Jesus faith? It's a tough one. I'm so glad I'm not preaching it. But here's what's powerful. I can promise you this. I've never met a person who has made a conscious effort to move from shallow faith to passionate spirituality whose life is not radically transformed, who doesn't have a peace that will blow your mind Because here's the thing, passionate spirituality will revolutionize every relationship in your life. Every one of them. When you and I get deep into our spirituality, passionate about God, it changes every relationship. It changes your relationship with your spouse. It changes your relationship with your children. It changes your relationship with your boss, with your employers, with your team members at work. It changes your relationship with the people that you used to think of as the worst sinners on the planet because deep 
enduring, passionate spirituality for the living God puts mercy in our hearts and puts humility in our hearts and puts a desire for justice and disciple making, puts it deep into our being and it changes the way we look at people and it is what empowers us to love our neighbor as ourselves. To say to that person, you know what? I might disagree completely with what you're doing, but I love you and I will walk with you through it and I will be the first person on the other side of it to love you. Let me share with you something I didn't share with any other service. And this is really controversial, so don't freak out on me. Don't send me an email because I'm not perfect and I might not have this all thought out, but I just want to share with you something that challenged me this week, okay? Deal? Good. Because I just, I just don't need your condescending emails because I'm not perfect, all right? So if you have this one all figured out, just pray for me, okay? So I'm reading this book. And this, the woman who wrote this book uh, had an abortion. And she talks about how in, in one time she was writing that this person said to her, hey, you know, maybe, maybe your reason for always wanting to adopt kids is because of your abortion and you just feel really guilty about that. And she wrote in this book, she said, you know, I don't feel any sense of shame in my life for that decision that I made. And she said, I did the best with what I could at that time and shame has no place. It cannot hold me, it, can't, it doesn't move me forward. And so I believe in that moment, I did the best I could with the best I was dealt with. And would I do things differently today? Maybe. And she says, you know what, but there's what I know as, as a person who's coming to faith and is trying to follow Jesus. She says, you know, if a young woman came to me and said, I am pregnant and I don't know what to do. She says, this is what I know I would do. I would welcome that young woman into my home and I would let her live there while she was pregnant. And I would do everything I could to help her have that baby. And I would help her raise that baby. And if she didn't want to raise that baby, I would do my very best to walk with her and I would take that baby from her and for her and I would raise that child. And if she didn't want to carry that baby and she made the decision to go get an abortion, I would walk with her and hold her hand in that abortion clinic because I wouldn't want her face to see my face when it was done. And I would want to be the first person to love her even in that choice. Now that is some crazy, crazy way of thinking that's so far outside the boundaries of what maybe if you've been in the church for a long time is. But what would, where would Jesus be in that moment? And you know what that story made me think about? Like, do I really believe that Jesus stands outside the door of the abortion clinic? Do I really believe that God stops outside the door of the adult bookstore? Do I really believe that God stays outside the study? when we log on to the computer and look at the images we're not supposed to, like God is right there with us in our foolishness and in our sin. And if loving our neighbor means holding their hand in the midst of a sinful choice so that the first person they see on the other side of that choice is a follower of Christ, wouldn't that be the most incredible thing to do, but wildly uncomfortable and deeply difficult? That'll mess with you. It's not shallow. But it's simple. Love God with everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. Develop that passion. And I think God could change the world with it. I think God could change our community. I think God could change your family. Because the greatest thing we could ever do is love. Even in the midst of disagreeing, it's love. And I want to figure it out. I don't have all the answers. I guess I just, I'm, gonna, I'm on this journey. And that, that, that kind of wrecked me. You know, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know that I would have done that yesterday. But I think I would today. I mean, it's just that, that, that's the reality of what it means to have passion and not check box. You can't check that box. Where do you check the box? I love my neighbor as myself. I just checked it. It's done. Man, there's a passionate spirituality there that will drive us. There's some next steps. We're gonna sing a song that's the core to it all, that God is a good father. And God, as our father, walks with us into those bad decisions and he never leaves us in the midst of the bad decision. The decision that we think, you know, when we look back on our lives and regret, like God's with us in the midst of it. He's a good father and the beginning of passionate spirituality is understanding that, that he is a good father and that we are loved by him.